Hey, Tada, this is Zola, 100% pure bread in South Africa with the South African stamp of approval. And of course, you know, I'm fully beveraged in South Africa, proudly South African. And you are watching a program called Sharp Sharp, which means mocha mocha, means pashash pashash, means perfect perfect. Wola <laughs> yeah. Now, would I be correct in assuming that Tupac played a big influence on you, inspiration? Oh! The life that Tupac lived played an inspiration. Him as a man, I don't know him. The stuff that I never met him, the stuff that I read about him, the stuff that I saw on DVD and back then in the tapes about his documentaries uh, and, and that beautiful book called Rose on the Concrete, those are things that gave me an insight of what kind of a man he was and how he died how he lived his life, how his mother was an active member of the Black Panthers, and how that, in a way, related to my life from when my mother was politically active to how she lived and how she was pregnant with me right in the heart of 76. Now she gave birth to me in 77, and how I lived a miserable life, how my father left me, how I grew up hard, and, and how I had fights with my mother when I was 17, 18, because I was a teenager, and how I struck it gold, and how me and my mother reconciled and healed and how I became a voice of the nation. I understand what Tupac went through because I went through exactly the only experience I haven't had that he had is that I haven't been killed yet, right? So I feel him, I understand him and I also understand that he could not sing about swans in a park. He could not sing about the beauty of, of how some, some Western books portray life, because he grew up on the concrete and he was a rose. He grew up hard, and I'm going through the same thing, right? And even worse in my country, I can never have the money that he had. But he also taught me that sometimes it's not about money. It's about letting it out and be fully used before you die. Right, so he, he used all of his energy. He was there, he fought every day, he fought politically, he fought spiritually, he fought socially. So even though he was a brother from another country, but what he was is like in direct, like parallel with what I go through every day of my life. Therefore, I feel him. I feel his pain, I feel his joys, and I feel what he was trying to achieve. And he was in a struggle. And a struggle is something that you never achieve. It's something that you fought until you die. Therefore, I shall also fight until I die. Him and I are, are birds of the same feather. It's just that I'm still here and mm. he migrated. If I look at certain music genres, like in the hip hop, a figure like Tupac, in the reggae, a figure like Bob Marley, would I be pretentious if I assumed that within the Kwaito you assume that role? Uh, I do assume it, but before I can even say I assume it, that role was given to me before I was born. That political role, that consciousness, that struggle, that pain, that pain that Bob Marley fought all of his life, the, the things he talked about in his music, for he could not pick up a gun and shoot a man, therefore he took a microphone and fought it on stage. Same thing that Tupac went through. I can say that, in a true sense, that role was given to me before I was even born. And it's something that I'm supposed to take it all the way for the rest of my life and hope that before I die, other kids will pick up after me and take the same role and move on until whatever the powers that be truly understand what we are trying to talk about. Both of these great men died tragically young death. There's something messianic in looking at both of them. Are we talking about Kwaito music as the music that will give us a South African messiah? Julius Caesar was killed by his own friends. Christ was killed by his own friend. Shaga Zulu was killed by his own brother. Tupac's death remains a mystery. Bob Marley's death I'm still trying to figure out up to now. And um, I do not wish to follow a legacy, a legacy of that um, I'm going to die. But I know that that's the way of the flesh. 
But while I'm living, I'll be preaching and I'll be singing. However, being a God servant is something that I very much like to do. But I cannot necessarily say that there's a Messiah in me, right? I, I may be a voice that maybe I might have inherited it from Bantu Stephen Pico and Nkenge and T.A.T. and Martin Luther King and Malcolm X and the Mahatma Gandhi. I'm a different voice that speaks a different language to a whole new different population. But I do not seek a Messiah in me. I only seek to be God's servant. And if God decides that the time has come for me to go, I will go. And how I go will be entirely depending on the situation. Somebody could shoot me. I could die from AIDS. I could die from a car accident. Anything is possible. But I know that one day I shall go the way of the flesh. But the most satisfying thing about it is that, um, you know, Tupac, when he says he was watching Marvin Gaye's show yesterday, I'd like to sit with Martin Luther King one day and, and bound to Stephen Biko and, and maybe grow my dreadlocks with Bob Marley. That would be a great feeling for me because I do not believe that when I die, that's it. I believe that when I die, I move to a greater power, a position which I was born for. The whole life, whether I live for 70 years, is nothing more than a test. The longer I live, the longer the test is extended. But there's a life after this, and that's exactly where I'm going. And if they decide to, to write books and movies about us, it would be great because they will push on the legacy that we tried to teach. But we only got to a situation of teaching because us ourselves were taught. And my greatest teachers in life are these kids because they know nothing about apartheid even though they are getting the reflection of it because they live in the ghetto. But they get a better chance than me. And if they ever tell the stories that I try to tell, they will tell them better. They will become better individuals than I am. So every day, a new generation will work towards cleaning the mistakes of the past and creating something new. What I'm doing almost has got nothing to do with the present. It's got something to do with the future, which unfortunately I won't be there to see because I'll have to move on. That's the way of life. And why I wear a seven on my neck every day is based on a simple fact that if you follow your Bible, right, you'll see that God works around the number seven. The alphabet itself, G for God, is the seventh alphabet. The Israelites circulate Jericho seven times and the walls crumble. Christ is killed on the sixth day and he rests on his grave. The first day he rests on his grave is the seventh day. God creates earth and man and then he rests on the seventh day. So we were a seven as a form of respect and a tribute to what God has given to us. And I could wait in gold, and the reason why I wait in silver is because Christ was sold with silver coins. So for us, it's a very tense spiritual thing that I cannot explain. So when I get on stage, and I see 40,000 people, I see beautiful black people all the way to the back there, and I got the microphone and I can hear them scream. I think I know exactly how soccer stars feel when they score goals when people scream, when, when, you, you're, when you're in the final, or maybe you're Kobe Bryant and, and you shoot the last basket and, and, and your team wins and takes the league. I feel exactly that. And my struggle though is a very political one and a very spiritual one. We, we're doctors of the soul. And everything around us is guided and protected by God. Otherwise I would have died at birth. I wouldn't have survived. So the reason I'm here is mainly to serve. And we strongly believe in one verse in the Revelation that says, behold, for a powerful nation shall rise in the south. That's why we're here. That's why we do this. And if we get paid while we're at it, so be it. Because I'd like to say that the God that I worship has got the most expensive account ever. He's more than a billionaire because he created all metals and all treasures. I refuse to be poor because there's this thing that if you believe in God and you follow God, you must be poor, you know? There they hit us off guard because that's how, that's how 
other people got rich and other people got very poor, right? And the richer get richer and the poor get poorer. I believe that if I drive a big, nice car, if I wear nice, if I live in a house that makes every boy want it as a dream house, as a dream car, as a dream chain, that means I shift the mind of a four-year-old to a 10-year-old from looking into a drug dealer as an example to looking into somebody who does something good. So if you're Christian or whatever religion you follow and it's associated with God and you're rich and you got money, you can stand up and testify that I have all of this because of God. You don't have to do crime, don't have to kill another person. Not that I'm rich, but if I, if I got money and I ended up being rich one day, for me, it would be testimony that because God gave me quieto as talent, here I am and anybody can follow me. Instead of my young brothers and sisters looking into drug dealers as examples. I, I dream for a day where Christians and, and Muslims and, and all the people who do good will own the big houses and the big cars because basically it says this is God's testimony that a man who follows God can live a clean life. King Solomon, King David, they were billionaires of the time and they were given their powers by God. Why shouldn't we live like that now? So, so I fight for my money, you know, <laughs> if I ever get it, you know. Yeah, so, you know, my, my biggest bank is up in heaven.